A particle is launched with a speed of 30 meters per second at an angle of 60 degrees. Find its height when its speed is 20 meters per second. We are going to do this problem in two ways. The first way is the old way, which we covered in the projectile motion section. And the second way will use conservation of energy. So here's the situation. Here's the initial velocity vector u. Let's write it in terms of its i and j basis vectors. Well, we multiply 30 cos 60 for the i component and 30 times sine 60 for the j component. So that gives us 15i plus 15 root 3 times j. Now, at some time, the velocity, or the speed I should say, will decrease from 30 meters per second to 20 meters per second. So we are interested in the height of the particle above the ground at that time. Now, we have a symmetry in projectile motion which means that there are two positions for which the speed is 20 and those two positions are at the same height above the ground. Anyway, we are only interested in the y position, not the x positions. So we can call that um, distance y or more usually we use sy, we use the letter s for distance, but this time the distance in the y direction. Now, we know that the x or the i component of velocity never changes because there are no forces acting in the horizontal direction. As soon as the particle is launched, the only force that's acting on it is gravity, which is vertically down. Gravity has no horizontal component. That means that it cannot change the horizontal component of the particle's velocity. So the horizontal component of the particle's velocity is constant. In other words, vx is equal to ux. And as you can see, ux is 15. So that never changes. What does change is the y component of the velocity. Since gravity is acting vertically down, it'll change the y component of the velocity. Um, we know how to get that using v equals u plus at. The equation for linear motion in a straight line with constant or uniform acceleration, but we apply it in the y direction. Okay, so we can imagine the particle's projection onto the y-axis, and the projection will move up and down uniformly. By uniformly, we mean uniform acceleration. Um, you know, what is uy? Well, it's 15 root 3. What is ay? Well, that's acceleration due to gravity. That's negative, so we put a minus g here. And vy is a function of time. Okay, so initially when t is 0, vy is just equal to uy, 15 root 3. And then vy decreases by 9.8 meters per second each second. Alright, so the acceleration factor is pointing down, so it's negative. Again, vectors pointing up are positive, so we've covered all this before. So, what is it that we want? We want the speed to be, the final speed, the magnitude of v to equal 20. Well, how do we get the magnitude of this vector? We just square its components, sum them and take the square root. We want this to equal 20. So, from this we can actually work out what vy is. The y component of the velocity vector when it, its magnitude is 20. So we can get this component here. Um, well, its square is 175. So if we get the square root of 175, we can get either a positive quantity or a negative quantity, and that makes sense. So the positive quantity is the situation when the particle is here, and the negative value of Vy occurs when the particle is here, because then vy is pointing in the negative direction. But we will leave our answer as vy squared for now because you'll see now in a minute that um, it's, we can use a handy formula to relate sy with vy and uy. So here is the formula that we will use. Um, again, this is only true for linear motion with constant acceleration a, and that's the case in the y direction. Ay is the acceleration due to gravity, which is negative. It's, it's minus g. So we rearrange this formula to make Sy the subject. 
and now we just plug in so you can see why I left this as vy squared what about uy squared where is uy yeah here is uy the y component of vector u so we need to square this it's going to be 15 squared times root 3 squared and we divide this by twice the acceleration well I'll just write minus 2g here well I put in 9.81 okay so vector ay is pointing down it's got magnitude 9.81 and it's constant. That's why we can use this formula. But this is stuff we've done before. Working this out to two decimal places, we get 25.48 meters. Okay, let's do it using conservation of energy. Okay, before doing this the new way, that is using conservation of energy, let's reiterate the condition for us to use conservation of energy. So we saw that we can use conservation of energy only when the only force with a component in the direction of motion is gravity. And that's the situation here. The only force with a component in the direction of motion of the particle is gravity. So here's gravity, it's got a component in the direction of motion. So when the particle is here, the direction of motion is tangential. So there's gravity, there's a component in the direction of motion, say when the particle is there. Actually, it's really trivial here because the only force acting on the particle is gravity. So we don't have to worry about, um, you know, is there a normal force? Is there a friction force? It's very straightforward here. Gravity is the only force acting. When that's the case, we can always apply conservation of energy. But more generally, this statement here is important because we'll see situations where gravity is not the only force acting. Okay, so what does the conservation of energy say? It says that the kinetic energy plus the potential energy at any point in the particle's trajectory is constant or conserved. Um, so we consider two positions here. The situation just after the particle is launched and the situation when the particle is speed 20. So we'll call this point 2. Now it's important that we say just after the particle is launched, because when the particle is being launched, um, there's, an, you know, there's a different force acting on the particle. The launching mechanism is exerting a force on the particle. But as soon as the particle leaves the launching mechanism, the only force that's acting is gravity. So we can use conservation of energy. All right, so immediately after the particle is launched, what's its kinetic energy? Well, that's half its mass times its speed squared. Well, we know its speed is 30. What's its potential energy? Well, that's mg times its height above some reference level. Well, we just take the x-axis to be the reference level. So its height above the reference level immediately after it's launched is zero. What's its kinetic energy at this new position? Well, it's half its mass times its speed squared. Well, we want its speed to be 20 and we want to add on its potential energy that's mg times its height above some reference level well that's what we're after actually so we can call that sy as before or we can just write h here i suppose we can just write h here an interesting fact by the way is that uh, the height h doesn't depend on the mass because the m's cancel out so um, the potential energy at point one is zero we just have to solve this equation here. Half of 900 is 450, half of 400 is 200. We get h equals 25.48 meters as before. In this example, a particle is launched with speed 2 meters per second on a smooth track. Its initial height, as you can see, is 3 meters. We want to find its speed when its height above this reference level is 1 meter. Now the reference level could be sea level, but whatever is suitable for the problem. Now, in this problem, you can see that there are two forces acting on the particle. Obviously, we have gravity, which is magnitude mg. That force is constant, never changes. But now we have a uh, contact force on the particle. The particle is in contact with this track. And uh, we've seen this before. The contact force is perpendicular to the direction of motion of the particle. So the contact force has no component in the direction of motion of the particle. Let's say the contact force 
has magnitude n and that changes all the time that contact force uh, when the particle is here okay we can see that the gravitational force hasn't changed this vector is the same as this vector here vertically down with magnitude mg but now n has changed you can see it's just a different direction from this end but no matter where the particle is n has no component in the direction of motion so at this instant the direction of motion is tangential to the track and n is always perpendicular to the surface of contact of the particle with the track now the track is smooth so there's no friction force if there was a friction force it would act along the direction of motion okay it would al act along the line which gives the direction of motion so it would have a component in the, in the direction of motion so we could not apply conservation of energy if the track was rough so the only force with a component in the direction of motion is gravity so when the particle is here um, you know the gravity does have a component in the direction of motion but it's the only force that has a component n does not have a component in the direction of motion all right so there's just two forces acting on it um, so we can apply conservation of energy this condition is fulfilled so this is actually quite a simple problem to solve we get the total energy at this position okay we call this position 1 so the total energy E1 at this position is the kinetic plus the potential the kinetic energy is half the mass times the speed squared well the speed is 2 Notice that we don't have to worry about the direction of vector u. The direction could be anywhere. It's only the magnitude that counts. The potential energy is mg times the height of the particle above the ground. That's 3. Now we look at position 2. The energy at this position is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies. So the kinetic energy is a half m times v squared. Now v is what we're after, the magnitude of this velocity vector. We can see, by the way, that the velocity vector is tangential to the track at this point. Um, but we're not interested in its direction. We just want its magnitude. Uh, the potential energy at this point is mg times its height above the reference level. Well, that's one meter. Okay, so we the total energy is conserved or constant, so we just set E1 equal to E2. So here we get um, a half m plus 3 mg, and over here we get a half m squared plus mg. Notice again that the answer doesn't depend on the mass. The mass of the particle can be anything. Um, we want v. All right, so uh, I've isolated a half v squared. Multiply this thing by 2, take the square root. Our answer is 6.58 meters per second. You can see that the path doesn't matter as we explained in the previous video um, all we need to know is the initial speed of the particle and the final position of the particle so I mean the answer that we got here um, would apply if we had simply thrown the particle vertically down with a speed of um, 2 meters per second so the direction of the initial speed doesn't matter um, you know, if we we could solve this as a linear motion problem with constant acceleration. So, how far does the particle fall through? Well, that's three minus one, which is two. So, as a check, let's do this the old way. The distance here, which we call s, is two. So, for linear motion with constant or uniform acceleration, we can connect v u a and s using this formula here. So the acceleration of the particle, well, that's the acceleration due to gravity, has magnitude 9.81. So we take downwards as being positive. So let's just check this result using this formula. So this is the way we would have done it before in linear motion. Well, you can see the similarity straight away. Um, v is the square root of u squared. Well, that's 2 squared, which is 4, plus 2 times a. Well, a is just g times the distance s which is 2 so we get root 4 plus 4g just like we did here 
and this is 6.58 meters per second. So this, so conservation of energy agrees with doing the problem using linear motion. So that's be, we can do it using linear motion because we know that um, if gravity is the only force with a component in the direction of motion, then it doesn't matter what the path is. If this track was rough, then we would have a friction force, and friction is in the direction of motion. Well, it actually opposes the direction of motion, so conservation of energy would not hold. Finally, we look at a pendulum bob that is released at a height of 0 0.5 meters above this reference level. Okay, it's released from rest, so its initial speed u is 0. The reference level runs through the center of the bob when the bob is at its lowest point in the trajectory of the bob. We want to find the maximum speed of the bob. Now, we will soon see that the maximum speed of the bob occurs when the bob is at its lowest point. We kind of know that from experience, but it will also uh, come true when we look at the conservation of energy of the bob. Okay, the velocity vector of the bob is always perpendicular to the string attached to the bob. Okay, it's um, in a direction that's tangential to the circular trajectory of the bob. Okay, let's uh, see a justification for why we can use conservation of energy. Let's just look at the forces on the bob. Well, gravity always acts, of course, it's equal to the mass of the bob, which we will say is m times g. And there's another force acting on the bob. The bob is obviously attached to a string, and the string acts, exerts a force on the bob that's in a direction away from the bob and along the string. Let's call this force T. Okay, so the direction of motion of the bob at this instant is tangential to the circle. I'll show it here in blue. Um, this is the direction of motion. So you can see that T is perpendicular to the direction of motion. And that's the case no matter where the bob is. Because T is along the string, and directions along the string are perpendicular to tangents to the circle, tangent at the point where the bob is, okay? Um, that's because a line joining the center of a circle to the point of contact of a tangent to a circle is always perpendicular to the tangent. You can see that vector t is constantly changing. Well, its direction is certainly changing, and actually its magnitude will change also. So you can see in this situation there are two forces acting on the bob, gravity and t, and gravity is the only force that has a component in the direction of motion. So we can resolve the weight vector in a direction that's tangential to the circle at this point. And we do have a component, but t doesn't have any component. So we can apply conservation of energy. So we can take what looks like a very complicated problem and turn it into an easy problem. Um, we consider the total energy of the bob at this position here, when it's released from rest, that's position one, and then the total energy at position two, when the bob reaches its lowest point. So we put our reference level here for convenience. We could actually put our reference level down lower, and uh, we would see you know, the same term on both sides of our energy equation. That would cancel out. That term would be mg times this distance here, but you know that term will be the same on both sides, so we don't need to put a reference level there. Of course, we need to put a reference level either through the bob or below the bob. We certainly can't put it above the bob. Then we would be talking about negative potential energy, and we don't want to go there. So the total energy at point 1 is equal to the total energy at point 2. Total energy at point 1 is kinetic energy at point 1 plus potential energy at point 1. That's um, equal to kinetic energy at point 2 plus potential energy at point 2. So what's the kinetic energy at point 1? Half the mass times the speed squared. It's released from rest, so the speed is 0. Plus the potential energy, that's mg times the height of the bob above the reference level. It's 0.5 meters. That's equal to the kinetic energy at the lowest level, half mv squared, where v is the magnitude of this vector. By the way, this vector here is not the initial velocity vector. I was only showing the direction of motion here. The initial velocity vector is zero. Um, right, 
and the potential energy at point 2 is mg times the height above the reference level. Well, that's zero. By the way, an interesting fact here is that all the energy at point 1 is potential energy. See, there's no kinetic energy. The bob isn't moving. Its energy of motion is zero. Speed is zero. So the energy is entirely potential energy when the bob is here. And uh, that energy gets totally converted into kinetic energy. See, the energy of the bob at point 2 is entirely kinetic energy. There's no potential energy. So we could think of, um, you know, potential energy being converted into kinetic energy. And as the bob continues its upward motion, the, kinet the maximum kinetic energy that it will have down here will be converted into potential energy. Okay, uh, let's just solve this first of all before we consider a subsequent motion of the bob. Um, you can see that the ma this result is independent of the mass, the final, the speed at this position. The m's cancel. And uh, how do we get v? Well, we multiply both sides by 2. So 2 times 0.5g, that's g. And we take the square root. The two decimal places, we get 3.13 meters per second. Now, let's consider the subsequent motion of the bob. Suppose that we want to answer this question here. Find the height when the velocity of the bob is zero. Okay, so here's the initial position when the bob is at its lowest point. Let's call that position two. So we know that the sum of the energies, kinetic and potential at position two, will equal the sum of the energies at position three. So the kinetic energy at position two is a half mv squared. Well, we can call it u in this case, actually. Um, I'll just call it u now because for this leg of the motion, the initial speed is u. So this is vector u, and its magnitude is u. The potential energy is mg times zero. So at this position, um, all of the bob's energy is kinetic energy. Its potential energy is zero. The final position of the bob, all its energy is potential. See, the speed is zero. And the potential is mg times its height above the reference level. So here's the height. Now, it's going to be no surprise that the answer we, that we will get for h will be 0 0.5. There's a symmetry here. Okay, I forgot to plug in for u here. We know what u is. Well, um, we know what u squared is. If we square the square root of g, we just get g. So we get a half g equals g h. The g's cancel, and we get h equals a half of a meter, or 0.5 meters. So when a bob is released from rest at a height of 0.5 meters above um, its lowest point, point, the maximum height that it will reach is 0.5 meters, the same height at which it was released from. In reality, the final height of the bob will be slightly less than the initial height, because other forces are coming into play here. Um, you know, there's usually a certain amount of air resistance, and also the tension force mightn't always point directly towards the center. You know, it's possible that with whatever string is used that's attached to the bob that occasionally you know the string might warp or something so that this force t might have a, a slight component in the direction of motion which slightly violates the conservation of energy um, of course if there was no air resistance and if this vector t was always perpendicular to the direction of motion then you know conservation of energy would apply exactly and the final height above the reference level would be exactly equal to the initial height above the reference level. What we can say is that the final height above the reference level is never more than uh, the initial height of the bob above the reference level.